Anyway, here we are for another week. I, I guess the thing that's really dragging me is if you have, and this is relevant to what's coming up, is if you have to do anything else on top of the teaching and the video editing and, and you know, your usual schedule, like Judith, you said you're into a rhythm and that'd be great, but doing one thing extra just can really, mm, yeah. And for me this past week, say I'm building up my excuse why I don't have my lab three videos uh, completed. <laughs> but I've been working on a grant with Tim Spock, which is relevant to all this stuff here. A, you know, we built Afterglow Access, this Afterglow 2. It's also called Afterglow Access because it's supposed to be accessible to blind and visually impaired students. And it is, it works with screen readers. The Skynet website works with screen readers. And uh, as you're playing around on the Skynet website, you know, we have these cool graphical interfaces like the Sky Viewer, that little planetarium program. If you play around with it, there's a like a button above where you can remove it and replace it with a tab and text menu. It looks really boring and you're thinking, why would I ever want to do this? But it's because blind students really can't use a mouse. And and so they have to tab through different fields and have the screen reader read it to them. So under a lot of these things that oh. you're using mouse, we have the tab and text interfaces and so Skynet is the Skynet website is mostly good there and the Afterglow website is very good in terms of screen, screen reader and actually if you look in the upper right hand corner under the about or something there's some description uh, of the different features we have extensive keyboard shortcuts that they use a lot um, they're, they can customize the, the color palette because a lot have some level of sight, but the, the contrast has to be different than what we're used to. They can change font sizes and font widths and things like that. A lot of it was user-centered design where we had a team of young, these were young kids, blind, visually impaired, that would uh, program oh. the software, detect tech programmers, and iterate. But it's really for kind of these uh, things that impact just the, the flow of the website and not necessarily the activities. Buried in there, we do have a sonification tool. It's a prototype. Mm. We'll take an image and turn it into a sonogram, something they can listen to. Oh. With frequency on the horizontal axis. And so low frequencies on the left, high on the right. And also if they're wearing earphones, the left side of the, the low frequencies come in this ear and the high frequencies this ear. Oh, wow. Time, you know, and you play the keyboard as it goes up the image. And it was a prototype that we threw together, but now we're long, I was gonna say long story short, but it's already a long story. Uh, we're putting in a new grant with Tim Spuck. This will be a $3 million grant, so a big grant. The last one was two and a half. These are big grants, huge teams. And uh, the idea is to build off that and add much more BVI functionality so they can actually complete astronomical tasks. Right now with the sonification, uh, you can listen. Like I, I can hear the difference between a globular cluster and a galaxy and a nebula. If you have a satellite image, like someone put their finger on the keyboard went And so there are some distinct signatures. So you can do broad classification, but can you do astronomy? Like could you find a moving asteroid and photometer it and measure its rotation? And so this would be a high school level curriculum they're putting together with two units. One is just that mm. variable in the asteroid. And let's see, I'm going to mute. It's usually Judith that has, yep, it's you that has the static. So I just muted you. And um, you're, you're okay. Uh, <laughs> just unmute it when you have a comment. Yeah. And the other is color, which I know all of you want in Afterglow. So we would build that for sighted students and for blind students, where for the blind students, it'd be represented by timber, which it, since I've, you know, I've been learning a lot about this over the past week, so sorry for the long story, but it is interesting it, to me anyway. You know, timber is the shape of the waveform. If the wave is like a sawtooth pattern, it sounds kind of like a brass instrument. And if it's like a smooth sinusoid, it sounds more like a, wind, a woodwind, you know, something like that. So in addition to just playing volume and frequency, we can play timber to represent color. And the, the blind students, they have a hard time. They're great with point sources because there's plucking keys. But extended readings, it's like 
I just put my arm on the keyboard and I'm holding it down. <laughs> and so that's tougher for them to do, but they should still be able to tell color. They could tell me if it's um, um, an emission line nebula, like red you know, bomber alpha, or if it's a reflection nebula, which will come in blue, it'd sound like woodwinds, where the bomber alpha would sound like brass. They can tell me a red galaxy from a blue, at least in theory. And uh, navigation tools and marking tools, like you mark a source by clicking on it. And then we have a centroiding algorithm that zoom, you know, finds the true center and puts a circle around it. And they need to mark stuff, but they can't use a mouse and they can't see a circle. So all sorts of interesting features will come of this if funded. But that's what I've been doing this past week. So that's why, so I get my, that's a grand excuse why I didn't get to the lab three videos this past week. That's a wonderful excuse. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Dan, I have a question yeah. about that well, yeah, while you're on the digression. We yeah. have one of, one of our applied mathematicians here models music. That's what he does. He models things like, you know, timber and all these other things. And is so, and I was wondering whether I should send you and him an email and make you meet each other. That would be great. Yep. I'll do that. And you know, I'll send back a cursory thing, and then six months from now, whether we, you know, if we get the funding out, I'll send back a more extensive thing. Oh my God, I actually have to make this work now. Um, <laughs> have a meeting. Can I ask a quick question about that as well? Um, the RGB stuff is going to, is, is that part of the current grant or would that be part of the next one? It's not part of the current grant. Oh. I did put in a small UNC system wide grant uh, last week or two weeks ago. I might have mentioned it. And that would include some of the beginnings of this. It would include getting the color stuff started. It's 30,000 versus half a million, but. Still, if I get some money, I'll, I'll get going on it. That's awesome. I just, my students are so, so excited about RGB. Like even the ones that aren't in the class that are just in the astronomy club are like, like I just give them some images that I have and I have like a set of instructions for GIMP and one for Photoshop and one for Astro Image J and like a couple JS9, a couple others. And I'm just like, you know, here's some instructions, like find one that works and they are all so into it. Like, it's most into. yeah, and sadly we can't, we shouldn't do that in the Opus curriculum because it's carefully designed to scale to right. sure. institutions. And once we start doing that, that eats into the, the time. Um, but if a student has extra time, uh, we encourage them to spend it this way, uh, maybe closer to the end. Once they know how much time they have left, they can do a 40 second exposure three times if they have the uh, time left. And we will write up a little uh, description independent of web assign, independent of Opus that they can download and use. So that's coming. And, and Jonathan, I should say I, my number two programmer, uh, Vladimir Kuprianov, um, he's He's an asset for a number of things. He's like the world's expert in street photometry, but he's also classically trained pianist and, and music music theory expert. So that's, if we do get the sonification funding, that's also a nice asset to have. He's been a huge help with our observatory, uh, by the right. way. Working with you. Just so you know, yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah, he has all the hardware expertise. You know, he ran the Russian network um i saw you know like the comet mm -hmm. um he he didn't i mean he was the glue that made it work uh, i stole him from them and um yeah he he knows his hardware really well thing is until i get visa stuff so out, i can't send him out of the country to my telescopes but uh, uh is, is he um is he is he in chapel hill now or is he oh yeah he's in chapel hill yeah. yeah so he's just nocturnal he's not like He's nocturnal, yes. <laughs> Josh works during the day, Vladimir at night, so it's a good system. Anyway, uh, so <laughs> uh, fun little pre-discussion here, though we have a lot to go through, so let me check my notes here. Lab four, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what's in it in a second. This is our parallax lab, and I'll talk about how it fits in. Lab four, has a manual component and a, um, a Skynet component. 
you know, they're going to be learning parallax. So the manual component, they're going to measure parallax kind of on the scale of, you know, their vicinity, a couple buildings around them on human scales. And so a manual exercise, which again, are, it's good to pepper a few of these manual exercises in there. They like them. They like the Skynet stuff. They like taking the pictures, but they like working with their hands too. And so we begin with a manual exercise, and then we have the Skynet portion where they're going to measure distance to a main belt asteroid, which you're going to observe. In the past, we used archival data. It's been reworked such that you can collect the data yourself, one set for the class. And then uh, to Venus to determine the astronomical unit, and then to um, Alpha Centauri using the astronomical unit. I'll get back to all that, but the point is the manual and Skynet. And what I normally do is I do it in one week, but it and we have one hour, 50 minute labs, but it's it's a little bit more than a single lab. And it's because of that manual component. We have to take the students to a location on campus. Fortunately for us, it's the roof of the same building they're in. You all may have to take them a little bit farther. And then they come back. The nice thing is the Skynet component, those three measurements, the main belt asteroid, Venus, Alpha Centauri, it's the same task in a row. It's repetitive, uh, but the good kind of repetitive, reinforcing um, how to do this. And so you could do the manual part and have them do one or two of the, the Skynet parts and they can finish up at home. Since it's repetitive, they've done it one to two times, they can just do it again on their own. Or you can schedule it for two weeks. This semester, I scheduled it for two weeks because I figured the manual part with COVID, I'm going to have to spread them out in time and social distancing. It's outdoors. It's an outdoor mm -hmm. parallax measurement, so that, that's a benefit. But I scheduled two weeks. And now all my students are gone. They're home. I could have made it one week. But I'm going to make use of the two weeks uh, for us and for me catching up on these videos. And I hinted at it or maybe I just out and out said it in the email last night, the reminder email. So this week we're going to go through lab four and next week we're not going to meet. Uh, so we're staying on my sequence here at UNC Chapel Hill. Now, if you have lab five coming up and I think it's fewer and fewer of you, many of you started um, after me. And so they're okay. A few of you started with me. And so there may be one or two institutions that will be moving on to lab five in advance, but all the videos are shot and except for the overview ones and I will shoot them because we're taking the week off. So that's the plan. If you have a particular problem, you let me know and I can provide you some separate guidance separately. But we'll do lab four this week. And next week, instead of us meeting, I have a homework assignment for you because I know you have an abundance of free time. So let me share my screen. And really, this is, of course, as everything optional, but I would appreciate. Uh, okay, here it is. Let me slide you all to my other screen. So um, we're getting ready to release the next version of Afterglow Access. Uh, I was saying before, <coughs> that this is a small change compared to the last one. Going from Afterglow 1 to Afterglow 2 was a, a monumental change. Three years of programming went into it, but now we're doing now, now that we've released it, there's still, you know, we're finding uh, browser compatibility issues and just some things that could be done better. And so we will be releasing improvements to it. And these improvements will, the changes will be less and less each time. But this is the first release after that. And um, so there are some semi-significant changes. And I would just love if you went, spent some time playing with it. It's at not afterglow.skynet.unc.edu, but sparge. Let me put that in the chat. And again, I see lots of messages in the chat and I won't be reading those during this. I'll read them after. Um, okay, so sparge. And so this is the new and improved version. And you may already see a few pieces. The blue control panel is down here in the lower right. For you no know, zooming in and discarding your image. And the reason for that is we've introduced a tab structure. It takes a little getting used to. Like I, I currently have just three random images in here, a Saturn image, a Jupiter image, and a digital sky survey image of some, I don't know, some part of the sky. 
And you can see, as I click on each one, it changes what's in the tab. Now, if I double click, you may have noticed this went from italics to regular font, and it's locked in. So now if I click on another, it opens a separate tab. And that one, you know, it, you can put whatever you want in there, except the locked in ones until you lock it in, and then clicking the other opens another tab. So we have a tab-like structure now. And if you want a split screen, you, sorry, you left click, no, you right click, there it is. And you can split up, down, and here we have two of them over here. You can split these if you want, um, split left, right. And so you can split, you know, you can keep doing this if you have the screen real estate. And you can uh, create more real estate by closing some of these things on the edges here. So we have a new structure within the windows and for dividing windows. And uh, pretty soon you'll be able to drag. Like if you want to split the screen, you could grab. Let me put, uh, this is the highlighted one. I'll put Saturn and Jupiter in there. You'll be able to drag the tab and move it around and it will highlight the split. Also, you can drag and move it to the other window by putting it on top of the other tab. Anyway, so some changes there. Also, there are a bunch of small changes throughout. A lot of them are browser compatibility issues. I know lots of people are having problems in the, infer, uh, here it is, the information tab. And um, there should be more here. So that's already one bug. Now we, you know, here's the full header, but um, there's, we pulled out specific information and for whatever reason, oh, that's the DSS. There it is. If I go to a regular image, here's the information. Notice Julian date has been built into here. But some of you were saying, depending on what browser you're using, you couldn't see this information. Stuff like that. I, I'm not even sure of all the changes. I've already found a few minor bugs in this version. So your homework for the week that we're not meeting is to start to play with it. And we'll probably have even an update to what's on Sparge by that point. We have another round of small corrections that we're going to push to this. And once everyone is fairly happy, both our internal testing and any feedback you all give me, we will push this to the production server. And so when students type in afterglow dot Skynet UNC EDU, they'll be sent to the new version. And probably one or two of the videos, the tutorial videos, will need to be redone. And if I don't get to it and there's confusion, let me know and I'll reshoot those as well. Okay, questions about any of that? Okay, we have our plan for the next two weeks then. So let's dive into lab four and uh, let's see. Yeah, we got, oh, that's lab five. Here's lab four. So again, at the top, this is the old set of instructions. You've noticed in lab one and two, I've rearranged that. I've been shooting new overview videos. You should expect this top structure to change for lab three and lab four over the next few days. I'm done with my grant work, so that's gonna be my next focus. Um, but uh, the key thing that you're looking for in each of these instructions other than the links to the overview videos, is the what you must do next and what, what you must observe for the next lab. So, uh, in lab three, you're gonna be putting in some observations for lab four, and I'm gonna describe how you do those observations shortly. Uh, they're trickier, and the trickiest observation we'll do in the sequence, and you, the instructor, must do it for the class. Also for lab five, lab five, is we're moving along the cosmic distance ladder. So we go from parallax to standard candles. And let me just hop to lab five briefly and give you an overview. So in lab five, we're gonna be looking at our Lyries, which uh, are within the Milky Way. Uh, in globular clusters in the Milky Way, we'll be uh, using these in the next the lab after that to repeat the great debate of Curtis and Shapley. Uh, but anyway, uh, they're going to learn how to measure distances to R. Lyrae's, to Cepheids, and to type 1a supernovae. Now, the only Cepheid you can do with a small telescope that's in a different galaxy, not like ours with the Magellanic Clouds, there's only one, and it's a 60-day period. <coughs> so that has to be canned, because the students aren't going to wait for 60 days. And the type 1a supernovae, they occur randomly, so that's also going to be archival data. 
but uh, you will be able to collect the R. Lyrae data. R. Lyrae is the very on a time scale of a day. And so we, we tell you to collect 50 hours of observations. And so if you will be doing lab five in the short term, you'll want to put those observations in. I'm not going to describe it right now, but if you're one of the few schools in the boat of I'm doing lab five next week, even though you haven't explained it to me, Dan, um, there, you know, we have a tutorial under the, uh, the YouTube page. If you go to, uh, here we are, uh, lab five, view the playlist, there's a tutorial on, you've already learned how to monitor an object back in lab three where we watched a gas giant over and over and watch the moons go around. It's the same deal, but I have a short five minute um, primer on that. Anyway, that's there. Otherwise, I'll talk about that when we talk about lab five. I just wanted to mention that if you're doing lab five before we get to it, the instructions on how to put the observation in are there. Okay, back to lab four. Oops, that's lab five. Lab four. Okay, so just you know, pause. Oh, that was a whole, whole bunch of background information so far today. But now into lab four. So the goals. Here are the goals of lab four. And you will let me just set it up a little bit. And so you can see the pattern. Of course, lab one, they're just learning the skills, Skynet and Afterglow. Lab two, we're starting our journey through the universe. Lab two, it's Earth scales. And lab three, it's solar system scales. Galilean revolution, and heliocentric versus geocentric. In lab four, we're going to go from solar system to nearby stars, so we're encompassing that. And it's all through parallax. So again, here are the four components. First, they're going to use parallax to measure distances to objects on Earth. That's the manual component. And if you don't want to do it, you can just cut it out. Just like in lab three, if you didn't want to do the Venus exercise at the end, and you just want to do Kepler's third, cut out Venus. But then the next three are the Skynet components. They're going to measure the parallax are to, you online? to a main Yeah. Second. Is, what time we there we go. They've muted whoever it was. Okay. And um, uh, yeah, you're going to figure out the parallax and distance to a main belt asteroid that you will observe for the class. Parallax and distance to um, an object in the solar system, Venus, to determine the AU. And then once we know the AU, we're going to use it to do stellar parallax out to Alpha Centauri. That's the plan. Equipment, protractor with attached string. If you do the globe version of lab two, that's one of the supplies. So you'd have it all. It's a protractor, special kind of protractor that has a little hole in it that you can tie the string in. Who is it? It's probably you, Jeff. I got gotcha. you. Yep, that did it. Um, uh, so we talked about the Stellarium version more than the Globe version, but in the Globe version, they have this protractor plastic with a little hole in it that you can attach to the string. You get to reuse that component. This is how you're going to make your angular measurements. Though all your students are at home online, and, and they don't, don't have this, and you don't need to make them buy it. Uh, the Compass app on their phone works almost as good. And, and so that's an acceptable substitute. I sh should probably list it up here as well, uh, but it, I've built it into the instructions a little bit lower down. Um, I'll, I'll probably add it here as well. Okay, our background sections. Again, I know you know all this stuff. I'm just gonna very quickly present it in the flow that you might to a student. One thing I like to emphasize to my students is distance is the most difficult thing to measure in astronomy or among the most difficult things. We can't just see distance. Uh, and here's a, just a standard example. Here's a person looking up in the sky. They see two stars at the same brightness. Does not mean they're at the same distance. One could be more luminous and farther away, one less luminous and closer. So to measure distance, uh, astronomers have developed tricks, a bag of tricks and we call this bag of tricks the cosmic distance ladder. So this um, chart, I think I showed it to you before, uh, maybe in our general orientation, but it does show you what parts of the cosmic distance ladder we're doing in each lab. 
it's a nice summary of where we're going next. Lab two, we measured the size of the Earth. That's the base of the cosmic distance ladder. Lab four, we're going to use the size of Earth to measure parallax to things within the solar system and use that to determine the AU. That's Earth baseline parallax. We'll also do stellar parallax once we have the AU to get to nearby stars. The next lab, we're doing standard candles, so our Lyries to get on galactic scales, Cepheids to get to nearby galaxies, type 1a to get to far away galaxies. Lab 8, we'll do Hubble's Law, which was built up with those faraway galaxies, but then you can use it as a tool to measure distances farther out. And there will be a Lab 9 in this other grant that I got, this gravitational wave grant, the broader impacts piece is to build a Lab 9, a multi-messenger astronomy lab uh, using gravitational waves and the data that Skynet collected uh, to find the first optical counterpart. And you can measure Hubble's constant, not super precisely, but you can measure Hubble's constant using that data. So there'll be a ninth lab on this chart probably within a year's time. I had to update this chart when I updated the labs because we can now measure parallax much farther out. Uh, when I did this lab in 2008, we can go out to like 500 parsecs. Now we can go to 10 kiloparsecs uh, because of Gaia. And, and um, of course, this doesn't include every technique on the cosmic distance ladder, but it, it's the key one. These are the key ones. Okay. And then some background on parallax. Uh, I start by having my students do the standard finger exercise. I tell them to grab a finger, preferably their own. Uh, you know, it's good to build in these little canned jokes they use semester after semester, but it makes them chuggle, uh, chuckle. And, you, you know, when it's close and you shift from one eye to the other, you get the big angular shift and far away, the smaller angular shift. So it's an opportunity to introduce the terms. The baseline is the distance between the observing points. In this case, the distance between the eyes. Uh, you have the distance to the object, which is the finger. And then you have the angular shift which you measure with respect to uh, you know, a farther away background scene. And so you can then see this here with Earth baseline par parallax. In this case, we're looking at the moon. And the parallactic shift being on one side of the planet, this is, of course, a terrible diagram. They should have the North Pole here because the moon is not in a polar orbit. But uh, uh, it is what it is. And um, the, the parallactic shift of the moon from one side of the planet to the other is about two degrees. It's huge. It's four moons. And, um, you know, in lab one, the students observe the moon. And it's, that means in Skynet, we've coded in this geographic longitude latitude parallax effect, or else they'd totally miss the moon. It'd be off by two degrees. And then you have stellar parallax. Instead of opposite sides of Earth, it's opposite sides of Earth's orbit. And when doing Earth baseline parallax, I always give them the diameter of Earth. You know, they measured it in lab two. Stellar parallax, I don't tell them because once they know the definition of an AU, they should know that opposite sides of the orbit is 2 AU. You could tell them 2 AU uh, or you can test them, see if they can figure it out. But it's the same geometry. Of course, these shifts are going to be much smaller, arc second or less, um, because the stars are so far away. And here you have. Uh, the geometry of it, and this should look familiar. We did this in lab two. We did this in lab three. In lab two, it was to measure the size of the earth, the difference in latitude, measured the, how high the sun was in the sky at midday, and used this math to figure out the circumference and diameter of earth. In lab three, we need to figure out one arc second at the distance of my gas giant corresponds to how many AU. And so, again, we're emphasizing this particular geometric structure. This is small angle approximation, uh, where basically this angular shift is a fraction of 360. It's the same as the baseline, as a fraction of the circumference of this big circle centered on the object you're looking at. So the radius is the distance away. So again, same equation. They've seen it a zillion times now. In my lecture course, I emphasize this a lot too. And here we've solved for distance. So you know your baseline. It's either Earth's diameter or a fraction thereof, as we'll see, or 2AU. And uh, so they're measuring their angular shift, and they just got to remember to convert it into degrees. And we always put that reminder in bold. 
Okay, let's go into the procedure. First, the manual component. So it, first, it I describe what I do at UNC. So it's a nice setup, and you'll want to find a similar setup at your university in non-COVID times. There are also instructions for how they can do this at home. So we have this gorgeous observing deck. We built a new building. Uh, we brought in this astronomy donor. I was young and untenured. So the higher ups came to me and said, this guy, he's tricky. Um, I mean, this is before 9-11, he had permission to fly over military bases and, and use their target range in air. And, and just, you know, he, he, he's like the US head of Nokia or something. Anyway, um, they said, he's gonna say, what do you want with this money? And this is not what I wanted with this money, but being young, untenured, I said, oh yes, we want this wonderful observing deck that overlooks our athletic field lights. So it's useless for dark adaptation. And the north wall goes up so high, we can't see the pole stars, so there's no polar alignment. So I have this wonderful deck that can't be used for astronomy. Uh, we use it for this. It's about 90 feet across. And I've picked two objects, one nearby, a smokestack on the building across the way, and then our campus water tower. It's important you pick objects that are kind of perpendicular to your baseline, because we don't want to get into trick here. And then using the protractor and string, they stand on one side and measure the angle, and then they go to the other side and measure the angle. And I have them start with the nearby object. They put the first angle here, the second angle here. It's about a degree or so. Um, the difference here, and then they have to measure the distance between their observing points. And I give some of them tape measures, some of them yardsticks, and, and I, I don't tell them how to do that. I let them figure it out because they can either do the tape. It's a 20 foot, five foot tape measure for a 90 foot space. So they can figure out to do it again and again, or the yardstick over and over, or they can look at their feet. We have concrete pavers that are two foot pavers. So they could count those and multiply by two. Yeah, I have fun with that, but it depends on your setup there. They get the distance, and so then they plug it all in. The baseline is the distance that they just measured, the angular shift, they have to convert. Well, it's in degrees, the protractor's in degrees. And um, they get a distance to the smokestack. And then I tell them the true distance to the smokestack. Now then I have notes here for, if you're, you're, you're an on-campus student at a different location, your instructor will find a similar setup. There's it just has to be a straight wall. It doesn't have to point in any direction. A straight wall and um, with two things in front of it. And ideally, the things are farther away than the size of the wall, um, maybe by a factor of three or four. One nearby, one far away. So you'll want to find some structure like this. If they're online, they can find their own. They can even do it inside, like get two sides of a table looking at a, a, a doorknob or something across. So it works. We do it with online students and it works. The online students, they will actually have to measure the true desti distance between their table and their doorknob or whatever they're using. Uh, but if you're doing it on campus, you'll want to figure out the distances. Like my smokestack's 360 feet away and the water tower's thousands of feet away. We're not going to be there with rulers. I use Google Maps and I find the true distances and you provide it to your students. So, you know, this, you have to, the instructions are the same. You just have to swap out the location. And then they uh, re calculate the percent error once they know the true distance. They repeat the exercise for the far away object. And here we just have it all in one table. Discuss sources of error. And there are plenty. Uh, just to rattle them off quickly, the consistency with which they position the string it depends on how they position their head with respect to the protractor. Is the protractor really flush against the background wall from one measurement to the next? Uh, the first one, it's okay actually if their head is misaligned, if they misaligned it exactly the same way between the two measurements. I, I don't test them on that subtlety, but they can say positioning the string, the, how flush was the protractor, the precision of the protractor. These are only marked at the one degree level, so they can maybe measure to half a degree. Um, measuring the distance between the two points, there may have been some uncertainties if they had like a 12 inch ruler that they had to do over and over a uh, hundred times. Uh, the smart ones, um, very, very rare for this to happen, but they can also say uh, that the line 
of sight to the objects was not perfectly perpendicular to their baseline, in which case the, the equation isn't correct. Or they can say, well, my object was kind of close. And so this is a small angle approximation. We're using the distance between the two points, not the arc of the circle. No one ever gets those two, but if they do, I'd certainly count them. Uh, so six things, any three, I give them full credit. And I ask them some questions here to make them think about accuracy and pre the precision of their measuring device. Like, um, which of your measurements was less accurate, which should have been less accurate? It doesn't always work out that the, the farther one is less accurate. Most of the time it does, but they could have gotten lucky. And so why should it be less accurate? Well, it's... You know, the farther away, it's a smaller angular shift, and you're getting down to the precision of your measuring device. And so that's where the uncertainty occurs. And here's just the same thing in a different form. For a fixed baseline, at what point does parallax cease to be an accurate technique for measuring distance? And I say, don't say 10 kiloparsecs, because in the background section, I say astronomers can now measure parallax out to 10. No, it, it's, it's again, once you get down to the precision of your angle measuring device, that's when the technique fails. Hey Dan. And, yeah, go ahead. I was just like looking at the Compass app. Um, do you need a string with the Compass app too, or do you just? Yeah, eyeball it. Yeah. Eyeball it. Okay. A string would. You could tape a string uh, to that special. You know, I guess on the Compass app, there's a zero, zero, and you could probably yeah. a string and run a piece of tape across your phone and do it a little bit more accurately. The thing with yeah. the Compass, it gives you an absolute measure as well in terms of the coordinate. Yeah, I guess if I like hold it up to my eye like this and like I'm like looking out the window, I can sort of like sort of align things with my eye to like a certain thing in the distance. It's less accurate than the protractor string and um, but it it does work and particularly if they're at home and they're doing a small setup because with the small setup they're probably going to have a bigger angular shift and, and so you know they're the small angle approximation will be more in error. They're building up error there, but uh, you know their angular shift may be 10 or 15 degrees because they're working from two sides of the room looking at something on the other side of the room. As those distances get similar, in, in compared to that angular shift, a one or two degree error isn't that bad because they can still measure it with some accuracy. Okay, thanks. So it found it works. I should say that idea came from Brian Pohl, who some of you know is uh, having some serious health issues. He's one of our instructors at Wake Tech. So uh, keeping him in our thoughts. Uh, his, prog his prognosis is not very good right now. So if you know him. Anyway, sad note there. Um, okay, but moving on. That's the manual aspect. And again, you could do this over one week, two weeks. You can cut out the manual if you want. I like it though. Now on to the Skynet astronomy side and here I'm going to show you how to put in the observation and I may run a little bit over today uh, I probably will uh, maybe about five to ten minutes and if you have to go I totally understand but it'll be in the video you can come back and pick that up at your convenience how to put in this observation this is the trickiest observation in the whole sequence and it's one that you have to do for the students um, let me uh, switch to my Put out some notes here. Uh, there's the manual. Okay, so it's tricky because you have to observe. So this will be a main belt asteroid, and you have to observe it simultaneously using Skynet telescopes on opposite sides of the planet. That's that's the challenge, and it's challenging because uh, Skynet is when normally it's just Q-based. You put your observation in and each telescope carries out whenever you want. So maybe you put an observation on a telescope in Chile and one somewhere up in North America and it would just carry them out at different times. You have to force it to work at the same time. And so for that, you're going to need a very high priority level, our highest, called target of opportunity. We normally only reserve this for gravitational wave events, exciting gamma ray bursts, but we've decided we will give it to you. Now you have to request it. And I should say there are archival images. We've rewritten the instructions so you can do it yourself. 
Before this, it was too complicated. Skynet staff took these observations once every year or two and put them in a common space, and those archival ones are there. And if you don't want to do this, you can use that. However, I would appreciate it if you did try it, because one of the things we're testing in the, in the grant, in the survey, we know students should get excited by collecting their own data. Do they also get that level of excitement or a similar level of, of excitement uh, if the data is owned not by them, but by the group? If they're just pulling it off some archive, they're not gonna get super excited. Uh, and here they can't do it because it's, it's tricky. I, can't, I won't give them all target of opportunity access. I'll trust you with target of opportunity access. So the idea is you would put the observation in before them, in front of them in the classroom. Uh, I know it's trickier in the time age of COVID, but uh, in normal conditions, you put it in and say, okay, everyone, we're gonna put it during lab three, you know, the beginning of lab three, everyone pause for a second. We're gonna put in our lab four observations and you do it in front of them after you've practiced it yourself behind the scenes. Uh, and so they feel they have some ownership of the observation. Okay, so how do we do this? So the instructions are written here. I have a tutorial, a, a lengthy video that shows it in great detail. I think it's like 20 minutes long, but again, on YouTube, you can always increase the play speed. Um, I, I try to make this. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, can I ask you a really quick question? So um, I expect the students would be as excited about instructors putting it in as themselves putting it in, but they would be even more excited if there's a place we could upload those observations afterwards that would like be useful to someone. Like the, does Minor Planet Center take these kinds of observations? Because then we could like have that be our thing that's in an astronomical database for the class and yeah. they would get into that. This is one, now they're going to be doing some really bright asteroids that may not be as exciting for like the Minor Planet Center. These are things that were discovered in the 1800s. I'm sure their orbits are nailed. Normally it's uh, new asteroids recently discovered that they're trying to pin down the, the orbits. But this is a popular student activity. Lots of groups do this. Um, a handful of different groups and I, I can look them up and put you in contact with them where they use Skynet telescopes with students to uh, determine orbits and they do put out these small observing reports which is a publication uh, that they're often high school students are getting so this is a, a cool way to transition into research yeah okay so the tutorial is here but I'm just going to kind of walk you through it today but you can always go back and watch that for reference First, you have to pick a main belt asteroid. So here's a link to a Wikipedia page, list of exceptional asteroids. And there, you know, you start with Ceres, which is obviously the biggest, it's a dwarf planet. In the lab, we said, go Sorry, ahead. I don't see that link in my web assigned that you say, you know, click here for a list of. Let me see, maybe, um, when you go to procedure B1, does it look like this? Mostly, I just don't, and I see the tutorial, but I don't. Here, under the first remember. It says from here, but it is not a link. It's not linked to anything. So it looks just like this. Select a main belt asteroid with less than 300 kilometers in diameter, parenthesis, e.g. from here, on parenthesis. Yeah, but the here is not a link. Okay, so this may be, because mine is. Skynet is also not a link, neither is prompt, all the prompt links below, but the tutorial is a link. Wild. Okay, so I would love for you to screen capture that, send that to me in an email with um, all your browser information. That's the same for me as well. What browsers are you two using? Uh, I'm in Chrome. Chrome for me. I'm in Chrome. That is kind of baffling. Well, I'm using, I'm looking at the assignment previewer, but you know, the tutorial is, um, is an active link. So I don't think it's the fact that I'm using the previewer. Yeah, I'm using the assignment previewer as well, and I have the links. That one is baffling, but that could be problematic if we see that in other places. That's something you'll need to. But the, the tutorial link works. Let's see, the tutorial link is to a place in MySpace. 
these others are two external links. Oh, but Sky yeah, the tutorial. All right. Welcome to the first. Sorry yeah. about that. The tutorial link goes to YouTube. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, it actually goes to uh, something in my place that redirects it, so I can change the YouTube video without having to bug WebAssign to change the link. Oh, okay. The others are going to external. One's going to Wikipedia, but the Skynet link's going to Skynet. That's, that's my place as well. So yeah, screen captures and information like that. And uh, I'll try to, I'll talk with my programmers to see if they have any ideas, because I have no idea. If we're all using the same browser, that's really mysterious. But we'll want to fix this. And um, it- I just looked in Chrome too. I don't have it either. They're not links. Could you, so put, the, could you put the link in the chat right now, just so we have it for our records moving forward? Yeah. And, and disturbing because I wonder if this is the case in many labs. Okay, so uh, it's a link to exceptional asteroids and in the lab we say don't mess with the big ones because um, they could saturate. We're going to do 40 second exposures. Timing is critical here. And so we're going to do a rapid sequence, 15 40 second exposures on both telescopes. We're going to tell them to start at the same time, but they may not because they may be wrapping up someone else's observation. They have time to slew in. Uh, so we do kind of want these 10 minute windows. And um, so it will be 40 second exposures and we don't want to saturate on these really bright ones. So you'd start probably checking with uh, Davida, Davida. So let me show you how this, this goes. I go to Skynet, I'm going to add a new observation. You basically start on the top of the list and you're going to keep going until you find one that's good. So I just looked up this asteroid and if I come down here to the air mass chart, nothing. So it's, it must be too close to the sun. In fact, if I go to now, yeah, <laughs> there's the sun, there it is. So that one's no good. And you just keep playing this game. And I did this ahead of time. I'll show you some that are okay, but some that are better. Let's try Eunomia. I think that was one that was okay. But not great. You gotta spell it correctly. Search on Eunomia. And you can see it, it's there's greater separation from the sun. So if I move forward, let the sun set. So it's gonna be near the end of the night. Here it is coming up. And let's see, this is I'm looking at Sarah Tololo right now, but you can go down to the air mass chart. And you see they're coming up at the end of the night. But again, we need observatories in both the north and the south uh, that are observable for a long period of time. Which one am I at? Yeah, I'm at Tololo. So it's up for just a smidgen, then the sun comes up. So it's not the greatest. You can see down, down here to 20 degrees, this green curve. Oh, it's so hard to tell with the colors. We are rebuilding this right now. I have a programmer rebuilding this where you can hover on individual ones and it blocks out the others, and shows you twilight, astronomical, and nautical, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but anyway, in the tutorial, I say, until we get this improved, better way is just to check up here. And so, yeah, it's observable at Saratololo. See, the way this is going to work, you request TOO access in advance, not, not the day of, but like a couple days in advance, so I can set it up. I will grant you TOO access on a telescope in Chile, probably prompt five, and then one or two telescopes in the Northern Hemisphere. Maybe my prompt Saskatoon telescope and another one. Right now it's gonna be, right now it's nothing because Chile is closed. If you do this in the next two weeks, you'll have to use archival data. But the Chile site's reopening and the robotic telescopes are gonna open first. So they should be back online in a week or two. So. You, Chile, I'll give you TO access on one of my telescopes in Chile, probably the prompt Saskatoon telescope up in Canada, and um, the Montana Learning, of the ones that are left with COVID, I think I'm gonna go with the Montana Learning Center's telescope at New Mexico Skies. New Mexico Skies is a great observatory, in, you know, in New Mexico, but in the US Southwest. So I'll give you access to those three. So one in the south where the weather's always good, 
and then two up north that you'll choose between depending on the weather. Anyway, it looks like it's up a little bit at Saratololo. If I go to, let's try uh, Saskatoon, which is um, Sleaford Observatory. Uh, here it is. I guess it could work. You know, he, it's also barely up at the end of the night, so you could maybe make it work. But much better would be to keep going through your list until you find one like Hector. Again, this changes with time of year. There we go. So let me show you Hector and how this would be much better. So here's Hector and you see it's up everywhere. It's well high in the sky. So if we check a couple observatories, um, here's Hector at Sleaford Observatory. Maybe I go back a couple hours, get it high in the sky, you know, which is the best observing pl place. Check it to Lolo. It's you know, high in the sky. So you pick some time around this time here. We can also check the Montana Learning Center, which is really New Mexico Skies Observatory, high in the sky. So we have sites in the south, one site in the south, multiple sites in the north that work. And so you want to pick a start time. And so look down here at the GMT. Or sorry, this is in universal time, but no, it's in eastern time, but you're going to want to convert it to universal time or GMT for later in the lab. Uh, later in this process, you're going to have to enter, hold all the observations until this time, then release them on all these telescopes simultaneously. So this looks like 926, 2 a.m. in the east. So um, that's seven hours GMT. Because, uh, no, I'm in daylight savings time, so that's six. I think it shows for whatever time zone your computer is in. Mine's in Eastern time. And so it says 2 a.m. Eastern time. So I add four time zones to get over to Greenwich and that would be six GMT. So I just write that down. We're gonna use that in just a second. Okay, we don't need the advanced settings. You may wanna check your numbers. The students should be using minus 12, 20, and 0 0.5. And then you go on, choose filters. And this will be a high through observation. Make sure nothing else is selected. Save and continue. And you're only going to pick one telescope for this. You have to enter this twice. For TOO mode, you can't throw it on every telescope. So I'm going to use prompt five, where I've granted myself TOO access. Nothing else is clicked, so I'm going to save and continue. And I want 15. Oh, and for this, you do this on the actual telescope. We're not going to do exposure scaling. You pick the actual telescope in 15, 40 seconds. This will be a 10 minute block on that scope. And you want to do that because you don't want it to scale down to, maybe you picked a really good scope and scale down to 10 seconds. They may not overlap in time. We're doing two 10 minute blocks and they have to at least overlap a little bit in time. And now right now it says the shortest allowed exposure length is 0 0.03 seconds. That means it's, there's a bright star in the field. That will sometimes happen. It's rare, but sometimes it happens. Go pick another asteroid or wait a couple days and it will exit the field. And then you're going to put in, oh, that's it, that's it. You just, oh no, no, down here, the start time. So under advanced options, delayed the start time until, let's see, it was 926 at, I can use the clock to pick the time if I want. Anyway, get it in there, set the start time, and also set the cancel time. You know, if one site gets weathered out, you don't want to burn the time. So just copy that over, paste it here, and add 10 minutes. That means you're only going to go for 10 minutes. If you're weathered out, uh, then it's not going to come back and do it, you know, three hours later when it's of no use for you. Save and continue. You submit it, and then you go back and put it in on the other telescopes. Now, before you do it, you may want to check the weather.
fact, I skipped a step here. Before you put them in, check the weather at each site. So here's the weather at Saratola, and these are linked in the lab, <laughs> for me anyway. Uh, we have this bug, but uh, in the lab here, it's lab five, in the lab here, I have links to the weather cha channel for a Chile and a variety of Northern Hemisphere sites. I don't yet have the Montana Learning Center's telescope in there. Um, that's near May Hill, New Mexico. And quick but, reminder, those links don't work for us. <laughs> yeah, they don't work for you. So we'll have to figure out why. But, you know, check and, you know, in Chile, it's clear uh, this upcoming night. Saskatoon, it's come nighttime. I'm on the 10 day schedule here. One second. Hourly. Mostly cloudy to cloudy. That's not very good, but I'll give you access to May Hill as well. And that looks great. So you'll put your observation in on Chile and in May Hill, and then it should work out. If you do everything right, it should work out. Target of opportunity is rarely used. There's some small chance that you'll be um, bumped by uh, a gamma ray burst or gravitational wave event, but it should work out. Trickier, you'll want to practice it, but it, and I did it really kind of quickie, quickly and sloppily, uh, but it's done very nicely in the video that you can watch. Okay, I'm at 12. If you have to leave, totally understand, but I'm going to go another 10 minutes or so, 10 or 15 minutes, and show you how to do the rest of the exercises in Afterglow. So let's see. I got Afterglow loaded here. Yep, okay, see ya. So you've collected your observations. Oh yeah, there's one last step. Once you get your observations back, so here's, here's an example that we're gonna use. These were taken from Chile and uh, you can see the start started, this was 2018, it started at 324.55. And using this exact procedure, uh, here's another set, this was taken at Dark Sky Observatory, 321.25. So you wanna look through these for one that overlaps. Uh, for example, this one here, uh, the fifth one down, 325.11. The first one in this sequence is 324.55. Those are within 16 seconds of each other. You want to find two of these that are very close in time. We do this rapid fire sequence because I can't guarantee they will both start exactly at the same time. But one of them in this sequence should overlap with one of the others. In fact, if you keep looking through, there's one of them in here, like the seventh one in the first sequence and the 11th one in the other sequence are only one second apart. Because asteroids, they move pretty quickly with time. So it's critical that you get two that are simultaneous. Okay. And you would mark this down and you would let your students know, okay, the observation, they can find it. They go to Skynet and they're used to loading things in user. They will go to group. And the group has everybody's stuff there and you'll tell them what your observation's called each of the two observations, they'll find it. You'll tell them which of the two exposures to use. Now, if you don't pull it off, don't get the observation, we have a sample directory as well. And you can go, you know, it's under sample 101 lab, lab four, we have a whole bunch of them. And I'm gonna show you this last one that was taken in spring 2018. These are ones that my group has collected over the years. We won't collect anymore since we've now given you the ability to do it yourself. But in here you see uh, a folder called movie and that's the sequence from one of the telescopes. And you can load all of these in and I've already done that. And the other is called parallax and these are the two, one from each sequence that occurred at pretty much the same time. And you can import those as well. I've already done that on my workbench. So with the asteroid, the first thing we need to do is find it. Uh, here's one of the asteroid observations. And I, I say just flip through them all, make sure they're all good. Don't include any that are bad. 
clouded out or whatnot. So those all look good to me. Uh, they all have stars in them. And so first thing you need to do is align them. And they all have the world coordinate system on it. So it's pretty easy. You go down to this tool right here, which is the aligner tool. Again, there's a video that shows you how to do all of this. Select the ones that you want to align. And that button selects all of them. But um, yeah, we don't want all of them. We want just, okay, nothing's been selected. We just want these Namusa movie ones. Okay, I've selected the ones I want to align and the rest you can leave as is. You want overwrite files, you submit it as a job and it's running the job on the Skynet servers. 57, 71, 86, 100%. So now these have been replaced. They've all been aligned with that first one. You don't see it, but the coordinate system, the world coordinate, you know, that they've been aligned using the world coordinate systems. So now that you've aligned them, you can stack them. And that's this last tool down here. I'm going to select these now aligned images. and I'm going to average them together. Because the question is, which one of these is the asteroid? It's not clear, that's what we're trying to do. So I've averaged them, spits them out as an extra file. Here it is. And so clearly this one here is the asteroid. So now they know in their images. Now some of them were flipped, like here it's flipped compared to this one. So you have to be a little bit careful, but it's this one of secondary brightness moving across there. So now they know, and the edges, they look crappy, but that's because th those are the parts that did not line up. The part that was in all seven of those images is this part right here. And now they know which one is the asteroid. In the old labs, we would make a movie and watch this, but movies are terrible for blind and visually impaired students. And there are all sorts of other things you can do once you learn how to align and stack. And, and so we're using that functionality now. Okay, you're gonna go through the same process with those two. We now know which one is the asteroid. So let's go back to the alignment tool, clear out the ones we had selected before. And now I'm gonna select those two that were taken at the same time. I think it was this one and this one. Submit, no, uh, submit, I've just aligned those two. This one taken in Chile, this one taken in Dark Sky Observatory. See how the Dark Sky one has been rotated. Here we're now aligning one from a different telescope and that telescope's camera was attached with a slight rotation. So now this one has been aligned to that one. I can stack them. Go into the stacking tool here, clear out what I had before. Gonna stack those two. Again, gonna use the average feature, spit out a new file. And this is the two of them on top of each other. And even if you didn't do the asteroid exercise, uh, identification exercise, it's pretty clear this one here is the asteroid. See how it's wider. So these are two images taken at the exact same time. This is not motion of the asteroid. This is parallax. I'm seeing it from two locations on Earth. So you then zoom in and we want to see the separate peaks. So I'm going to go to brightness and contrast. Go to the bright. See how they're using the same skills that they learned in the previous lab or in lab one. So I'm changing the brightness and contrast to bring out the two peaks. Now I'm going to use the measurement tool, with the centroid clicks, which again, they've learned in previous labs. That is the parallax between those two, 7.76 arc seconds. Now, let me just go back to the lab. I'm not going to repeat this for Venus and Alpha Centauri, but I want to show you how it all fits in. So back in the lab, 
Here are the instructions for identifying the asteroid. We got the tutorial. And again, here's what you just saw. This is the answer key. They don't see the answer key, but they'll see something like this. They'll save and upload their image here. And so they've identified the asteroid. Now they're going to measure the distance to the asteroid. And again, once they get that far along, they'll save and upload it here. And for the answer key, I, I gave that same example that I just showed you. Theirs will, of course, be a little different. Their angular shift they record here. And then we have a table showing the, di the fraction of Earth's diameter between Cerro Tololo and some of these northern hemisphere sites. And I will add the New Mexico Sky site but it would be somewhere between 0.55 and 0.6, probably. So they pick the fraction of Earth's diameter corresponding to their Northern Hemisphere Telescope, enter that here. They enter here what they measured for Earth's diameter in lab two. And I'll accept anything, they're not going to use that. They're gonna immediately enter the true value of Earth's diameter here. But this is to emphasize the cosmic distance letter. You measured the lower rung. And so we can then build off that rung to go farther out. And so I do this over and over, but we always switch over to using the true value, else their errors would accumulate from lab to lab. The baseline is the fraction of Earth's diameter times the true diameter. So in this case, between Tololo and Dark Sky Observatory, it'd be 0.55 times 12,700 kilometers. That goes here. And now that they know their baseline and they measured the angular shift, they got to convert it to degrees, they can measure the distance to that main belt asteroid. And it should be somewhere between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 9 kilometers. Uh, anything in that range is good. They could talk about sources of error. Uh, one of them is centroiding, uh, which shouldn't be that bad since if they use the centroid feature, uh, afterglow should get that pretty accurately. Another one is they weren't exactly at the same time because uh, there could be up to 20 seconds between them. There will be some motion. It won't be pure parallactic motion. Also, the baseline between the telescopes may not be perpendicular to the asteroid. That's the cheat. That's the biggest source of error. Uh, I'm only asking for two of these. Um, it may be worth emphasizing that for this to be really accurate, it needs to be perpendicular. It's approximately perpendicular, right? The plane of the solar system is like this, Earth is like this, though it, it does have a bit of a tilt, so it's not gonna be perfect, but it, it gets them within the right order of magnitude. Okay, once they've learned how to do this, they do it again. Uh, first, we're gonna do it for Venus, and the goal here is to get the size of the AU. And so we start with Kepler's third, which they've already learned about in the previous lab. Venus, we know, we observe to go around the sun every 0.62 years. So that means it's 0.73 AU from the sun. So closest approach, it gets 0.27 AU from Earth. That's the difference between those two. And in my lecture class, that's what we use. And we, go, we do this calculation in my lecture class. I say closest approach to Earth, it's about one arc minute of parallax. Figure out the distance to Venus. And once you know that distance in kilometers, that's equal to 0.27 AU, you know how many kilometers in an AU. Now that's not practical. In reality, you don't do that because if you're looking at closest approach, you're really just looking at the sun. So in the lab, we, we make it a little bit more realistic. We're going to observe the Venus when it's in a particular phase. And that phase corresponds to a certain place in the orbit. Uh, and for the data we're going to give them, that's 1.34 AU away. And they don't acquire this data themselves. They have to use the data we give them because, and, and you may like or hate this, but this is how we do it. Venus is bright. And so if you image, you know, that's, if you don't want to saturate Venus, that's a short exposure. And you won't have any background stars to do the alignment and to put a WCS on the image. If the image long enough to see the background stars, Venus is totally saturated and you won't be able to do a parallax measurement. So what we tell the labs, or tell the students in the lab, it's a bit of a lie, and you can, you can lie to them if you want, no one's ever caught on, or you can be honest with them. Uh, we tell them that I sprung for these pricey filters that are neutral density in the center. They block most of the light in the center, but not the outskirts. Put them on the telescopes, acquired the data, and then took them off, because there's no other use for them. Reality, we just doctored the image, <laughs> okay? 
<laughs> I, I didn't pay for these multi-thousand dollar filters. My postdoc was pretty good with Photoshop and GIMP. He even got the, um, uh, the, the uh, diffraction spikes in there. So WCS is there because of those background images. And I'll just show you what this looks like in Afterglow. Now here's one of the Venus images taken from Moorhead. Here's the other Venus image taken from Chile. And if you combine them, you get this weird thing. But see, all the stars are aligned. You can zoom into Venus. In this case, because the, the neutral density filter, you don't have to adjust the brightness and contrast. You can just straight up measure it. But in this case, you have to turn centroid clicks off and eyeball it. The centroid clicks will get confused because they're right on top of each other. So I get something like seven arc seconds. Lastly, it's the same. Well, I'll just go back to the lab and show you where they put the numbers in. They measure it, upload their image, angular shift here, fraction of Earth's diameter, baseline, distance, and then that distance corresponds to 1.3 AU, 1.34 AU, so they divide by 1.34, and they get the AU in kilometers. It should be 1.5 times 10 to the 8, so they can calculate percent error, discuss sources of error, same as last time. The reason we do this is we need the AU to continue along the cosmic distance ladder. We do that in the next section, Alpha Centauri. In this case, this is stellar parallax, not opposite sides of Earth, but opposite sides of Earth's orbit. And again, it's the same exercise. Uh, we provide them with the special neutral density filter ones because Alpha Centauri is pretty bright. It's actually a double system, A and B, triple system. There's another one that orbits around farther out. These are taken six months apart, so they have to be archival. The students can't wait six months to, to get this. And, and we're using the special neutral density filter. And you combine them, looks like this. These are both taken with prompt, just separating time. You zoom in and make sure the students don't measure from Alpha Centauri A to B. Pick one of them. And this one's a little saturated, so I'm going to pick this one here. I'm going to adjust the brightness and contrast so I can see the two centers a little bit better. And then measure, again, they're kind of overlapping, so you have to eyeball it. And it's not necessarily the brightest pixel. You have this distribution, maybe here, the center of this distribution, maybe there, 1.6 arc seconds. And then they do the same calculation in the lab and they get the distance to Alpha Centauri, calculate a percent error, and they should be able to get these to a few percent error. Because we're really in small angle approximation for the astronomical measurements. Their manual measurement will have many tens of percent error uh, depending on, you know, how far away from the small angle approximation. Anyway, uh, we've gone way over, 15 minutes over. I apologize for that. Uh, we had lots of stuff to present here, including how to acquire that, those observations. And, and that's stuff your, your students won't have to go through. So they're not gonna lose all that time uh, trying to figure out how to do that complicated observation. That's, that will be on you. So you take that out and this, is, this feels like a regular length lab. The only difficulty is the manual stuff. You may have to walk them to the place and walk them back. And so you may not be able to fit it in in a single lab period. Okay, I'll stop and answer any questions. All good? Hey, Dan, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, your your Venus pictures, um, wouldn't the smart student figure out that Venus must be in front of the sun? Uh, yeah, and so maybe, I, I, sorry, uh, if I didn't explain very clearly. Yeah, in my lecture class, I have to do the calculation uh, for closest approach, but in, which of course doesn't really work in, in practice. And in the lab, we're doing it in practice so they're actually not doing a closest approach. 
they're doing Venus at that particular gibbous phase, which means it's at that particular place in the orbit, which we then show them. Uh, I'll, sh I'll share and show the picture. Like greatest elongation? It's not even there. It's just one of the ones we had. In, in lab three, they have this bunch of sample images. And so I'm not exactly sure why but, this but one. But you all could use um, Mars, right? I mean, at when it's at closest. We could use Mars, Mars at Mars at opposition. At opposition, yeah. We could the other thing you could use are gong data um, from the the Venus transit. Ah, yeah. I that's how I've been doing it. Mm-hmm. The that, catch that, the, the only catch is that is that the sun is not very, very far away, so they have to do a little more geometry rather than simple parallax, which is harder. Yeah, yeah, there's some timing. Timing goes into that. It's not timing, because nope. they have, uh, uh, they, they have um, um, telescopes all over the world. Oh, oh, take it at the same time, and you're looking at where uh, Venus is with on, on the background sun. It's different. Yeah, 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 it's a Venus shadow on the sun is what you're looking at, the silhouette, actually. So yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Right. right, and so there's a slightly different um, um, geometry involved, um, but it's not hard at all. It's simple. Yeah, I uh, would still have to. Well, if they're taken simultaneously, yeah, you're basically aligning to the sun. You align the sun. Right. Correct. You align the sun, and that's what, and, and that's why it's a little bit different geometry. Yeah. No, that's cool. The, the other thing they could do is, and I, but this might be harder, is. Um, and I don't know how they would do it, but you can figure out the distance with Kepler's laws to that um, to that asteroid in AUs. I mean, historically, that was well known before the AU. Yeah, that is true. Uh, the, but it's hard. Yeah, it's hard, yeah. Because you don't know exactly where it is in its orbit with respect to us and the sun. See, with Venus, uh, it's nice because that phase corresponds to here. I see. And here, uh, we just give it to them, but they can kind of see it. If this is one AU, this distance here looks like about one and a third AU. And so we use the phase to get the distance. And, and they don't calculate it themselves. They just, we give them that and they can see where it comes from. And you get to use the same technique that you did for the asteroid and for, I, I do like the, the, the gong uh, transit idea, but uh, for consistency's sake, doing the same thing again and again, sometimes is boring and bad, but in this case, I think it's good uh, reinforcing how to make these kinds of measurements. And yeah, 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 it'd be cool to, to, to try it with Mars next time yeah. it's in opposition. I don't know when it is, but whenever it is, it'd be cool. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good idea. And then I can keep the geometry nice and simple. Well, yeah, because historically the transit of Venus way it failed, even though it was a very famous and made great and, and let the British Empire, you know, stroke its muscles. Yeah. But, um, but what they really did was they used a single telescope Mars and they just figured out where it should have been. Okay, I did not know that. But yeah, it does make sense that yeah, Mars might be an easier one to present here. Yeah. Let me write that down. <laughs> I have my, my list of ideas over here, so. Cool. Once they do the first one, which has that extra step of they have to figure out what point is the asteroid, but they learn how to do that kind of thing in lab one. Once they do the first one, those other ones go pretty quick. Other questions or any questions? Oh yeah, one more thing I, I put in chat. Um, if you want to give everybody 
Um, TO time on our observatory, that's fine with me. We're just, I mean, it's always cloudy here and we're just sort of working out the bugs. So, uh, but if there, but any, but you can just give them TO time yeah, all the time. Your, yours is ready, I'll probably do that. And I know this is gonna sound shitty, but uh, it, I can, it, Skynet keeps the TOO uh, on all the telescopes, that's, that's the deal. Uh, for the uh, gravitational wave stuff and GRB stuff. So unless, especially negotiated by contract, that's the default. And it, it falls under 10% time. So I can give it to them if I want to. <laughs> but yeah, but if you ever need to use TO on your own scope, we can always revert it back to that kind of thing. And um, at the moment, only one of the telescope owners and time owners uh, can have TOO, but the plan is to generalize it where there's a hierarchy of TOOs between the different time owners. And I assume you have a, you, you've been, you have a plan to have, have a way that you can put in simultaneous observations in the future without it being TOO. I mean, that would be a nice feature and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't conflict or anything because you just, because that's the constraint. We want them simultaneous, but we don't really care when it happens. It's far trickier that we are rebuilding the Terminator, which is the, the software at the scope, and to be much more flexible. And once that's done, I think that will be a possibility. Until then, uh, we will grant you the TOO. Uh, it's, but it says pretty clearly in the video in the lab, you just can't abuse it. You can't use it for other things and block the normal flow of Skynet. Yeah. But like I said, feel free to grant everybody TO of mine because cool. I don't think it's going to be, I mean, at least for the next little bit, it, we're still working out bugs. So it would be really great if people played with it. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> I've given, uh, you know, there's this time account and I'm adding the scopes to it as they come back online. I don't think I've added yours yet because you're, you're still debugging a few small things. Yeah, we are. I mean, we, 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 we did the dome all summer. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty much, we're still doing some debugging. And we also have terrible weather, but come winter, we should be fine. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm looking forward to adding it in. And, but, you know, once, you never know what might happen. Once the gravitational wave uh, fourth observing run begins, you'll be in that network and maybe you're, so yours is the scope that it gets it. It could happen. That'd be cool. Unlikely given a terrible weather, but that'd be great. <laughs> it can't happen. And, uh, even if we get any data, then, you know, you get leveraged into these papers. It'd be fun. Yeah. And in general, if anyone uses your scope for research, they're supposed to include you as an author for the work you've done to maintain the instrument. Doesn't always work that way. And sometimes I find out after the fact, but it's, it's there on the website. That's the rule they're supposed to follow. Builders lists. Anyone else? Okay. I will see you all two weeks from now then, and we'll do lab five. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. My pleasure. Oh, Peter. Yeah. And so um, I'm going to, I think I mentioned it. I didn't know you're on the line here, but the, um, your telescope, is the one in New Mexico skies, right? I run the one out in Utah at MDRS and I'm also New Mexico skies, yeah. Okay, and I'll, I'm probably gonna, the Utah one, is it connected right now? Um, New Mexico skies is running great and nobody's out at MDRS, so we had to shut it down. Okay. But we're hoping to get it back up uh, sometime in October. I think they're coming back then. So I think uh, then, as I said, uh, as I was going through it, the New Mexico Skies one, I'm going to use that as one of the TOO scopes. Right. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. And that's running well. And of course, they got the maintenance there and the crew there all the time. So Perfect. no problem. Sir. Cool. Awesome. All right. The issue with tracking and Vlad straightened me out. So we were all good. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> all right. See you all later. Take care.